The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Loss in our lives takes on many different forms and can be more than just a physical loss. It goes beyond that to include emotional loss, business loss, and loss of personal health. This is Voices for Healing with Kathy Roberts. Today, Kathy and her guests will help you find out that you are not alone in dealing with loss and grief. There are so many different ways to deal with loss. What works for some may not work for others. Together, let's find the solution that you can use. Here's your host, Kathy Roberts. Welcome, everyone, to Voices for Healing Talk Radio, dedicated to helping you develop skills and practices to heal loss and come alive. I am your host, professional counselor and educator, Kathy Roberts. You can learn more about me on my website, which is kathyroberts.net. And from there, you can connect with me on social media, including Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google Plus, and iTunes. In addition to the information that you get by listening to this radio program, I'm available for consultation in my office in the Washington, D.C. area. Today, my guest is Raphael Kushner, an expert at transforming loss and embracing vitality. Raphael, welcome to Voices for Healing. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be with you. I'm really glad you're here. Before we get started, let me let our listeners know a little bit more about you. Raphael is a leading voice in the world of emotional connection and present moment awareness. He has shared his unique approach to personal and professional development with millions of readers in O, the Oprah Magazine, BeliefNet, Spirituality and Health, Psychology Today, and the Huffington Post. He is the author of six books, lectures worldwide, and is a faculty member of the Esalen Institute the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health, and the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies. In addition, he coaches individuals and teams at Fortune 100 companies, governments, religious organizations, and leading nonprofits. Raphael's own heart was opened by an experience of profound grief. In the hour ahead, we will explore the importance of being present with and feeling all our emotions. We'll discuss going beyond emotional intelligence and including emotional connection in our healing toolkit as we find ways to allow more feeling into our awareness. People living with all kinds of loss can feel a lot and can also push down and act out a lot. Raphael, in your bio, you share that your own heart was opened by an experience of profound grief. Can you share a little of that experience with us? and how that brought you into the important work that you do? Absolutely. So we're talking about 19 or 20 years ago now, although I can still call it up as if it was yesterday. Um, and the, uh, the essence of it is the dark night of the soul, and that's something that I think probably almost all listeners can relate to, but the dark night of my soul uh, happened when everything fell apart in my life at one time. Um, my career went from being solid and um, you know, really inspiring to just hitting a complete brick wall, and yet that was nothing in compared to what happened in my personal life. I had waited a long time to find the right person for me. I had gotten married, and we were the poster children for conscious marriage. And then uh, I watched all of that fall apart in a way I had absolutely no control over um, due to addiction and and all of all that comes with it. Um, and so... I was in a tremendous amount of pain, and I knew I didn't want to run away from the pain, but I didn't know what to do with it. 
And that, for me, is pretty much the essence of the dark night of the soul. Nothing that you've used before really works in this situation. And it was that pain and that loss um, that was really pivotal in my life. And the thing that really changed everything was the advice that I got, um, which was to do nothing, to do nothing at all to try to change the way I felt. And at first that sounded like torture, but also it felt somehow strangely right to me because most people were just telling me to keep busy, and I knew that distraction wasn't going to be the road for me. So I did my very best, which wasn't so great. You know, I just kind of stumbled and bumbled along, but I kept turning into my pain rather than away from it. And that was how, you know, the the journey into the second part of my life began. Mm. I think of how many times in our lives things happen that we aren't looking forward to, we don't know are going to happen, we don't expect. And then what do they do when we do have when they do happen? And I think you're right. So often people are told to move on or get over it or stay busy. But you got some really wise advice to do nothing and be with yourself in whatever you were experiencing. Yeah, it it it's the advice that hits home, as I said, you know, before when nothing else works. Um, when people come to me um, to do healing work, I, I think we already are starting with the perspective that if other things that were easier were to help or were to get you out of your pain or distress, you wouldn't be here. In other words, I don't think anybody needs this work. I don't think anybody has anything wrong with them. So, therefore, I don't think they should do anything a particular way. What opens the door most of the time is when people reach that kind of critical juncture that I was describing where they realize, okay, I've tried all the strategies. I've tried the old coping strategies that came from childhood. I've tried new strategies that I've picked up from, you know, friends, books, seminars, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, here I am still with my pain. And I think that that's the place where the invitation starts to, to land in, in, in the best and fullest possible way. Mm-hmm. There's a lot that people do to avoid pain or tamp it down. And when we do that, it really will, it comes back. It's not going to go anywhere. Right. There's that classic uh, saying, what you resist persists. And I think that we wish it weren't so, but when we feel something or when a feeling arises in us, that's a better way to put it, it needs to be felt. And Mm -hmm. if it isn't felt when it first arises, unfortunately for us, it doesn't go away. And it stays in our body and it waits for us to feel it. And it keeps knocking on the door and the longer that we uh, don't feel it, the harder that it knocks. And so the, our stress ramps up, our negative patterns increase, and, you know, it's, it, it just intensifies as a part of our unconscious. And that's why it becomes so important to learn how to feel the old stuff and the new stuff with the emphasis on the how, on the how to, he- how to feel, because that's an education that almost none of us ever get. I agree with you. We Sometimes we know what we're feeling and we can identify the name of the feeling, but how to really feel it. What, what do you think gets in the way of our, um, our being able to kind of easily flow into feeling what we feel as opposed to resisting it? Well, I think... Um that you, you know from our previous conversation that there's something that I um, feel is just a critical piece that is there in our understanding of neuroscience but hasn't been brought out into um, clear understanding. And that's the fact that we have uh, what I call an evolutionary glitch in our brain. So when I go to workshops, I tell people, you know, all these problems you're having with your emotions, it's not your parents' fault. 
You know, it's not the culture's <laughs> fault. If you're looking to blame anyone or anything, blame evolution. And what I mean by that is that one part of our brain generates these emotions and needs these emotions to be felt. So it's basically saying, feel this. But another part of our brain, and here's the glitch part, can't distinguish between footsteps in a dark alley and, let's say, loneliness or grief or despair, meaning that it interprets difficult or challenging emotions as life-threatening. And so when that other part of the brain says, feel this, this second part of the brain says, no way, and it blocks the feeling. And it puts us at cross purposes because one part of us is saying you must do this one thing and the other part of our brain is saying you must do the opposite. And that's why it is so hard to feel our feelings directly and sufficiently. That's the bad news. The good news part is that we actually have the ability to rewire our brains to, to change that glitch or to repair it. Um, and that's really what I'm the most passionate about in sharing with people. Yeah. You know, sometimes when I'm talking to people about this, there's a sense that feeling whatever there is to feel might often lead to their annihilation, even. And that, as you were talking about, you know, you can't tell the difference between um, footsteps in a dark alley and something that is related to grief or a depressive thought or something. That makes a lot of sense that um, the, the feeling is so powerful that we feel like we may not survive it. Well, you know, it, it's interesting that you say that because I agree with one qualification. I, I think that we, it is power, what's happening is powerful to us and, and it, it, we worry that we won't survive it. But it's more our idea of the feeling than the feeling itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we tell ourselves lots of stories about how it's going to feel, but that's completely different from the activity when it happens. So let me go back to my own experience. Um, when I went through that dark night of the soul and finally opened to my grief, it was like a roaring wave that moved through me. And I felt like it was what I could call equal opportunity grief, meaning that I was grieving the loss of my marriage. But suddenly I also realized that, A, I'd never really known how to experience the feeling of grief before, so it was new. And then, B, I was suddenly grieving everything that I had yet to grieve from earlier woundings and pains in my life. And then... Um, see, I realized that actually as painful as this grief was surging through me, there was also a kind of satisfaction in it that I'd never read about or heard about, that a kind of human, earthy solace to being fully in the experience. And if I had talked to you about my understanding or concept of grief beforehand, it would have been totally different from what that experience was. And so I think it's a big challenge for us to recognize the difference between our idea of the thing and the actual thing. Now, I would never want to underestimate the intensity of um, anyone's pain or grief, but I do want to tell a kind of a silly story. Someone once said to me that, um, you know, when we think of that feeling behind that steel door that's protecting us from it. We think that it's, um, uh, it, it, it's like a, a giant dragon, a fire-breathing dragon. Um, but when we actually open the door, we realize that it's more like a gerbil in drag. <laughs> that was the, <laughs> the story that I was told. And I, well, I tell that, it's funny, it sounds funny. Like I said, I don't mean to minimize grief, but it highlights the huge difference between our thought about the experience and the actual experience. So yeah. I think it's really important to, to drive that point home.
Yes, I appreciate that and, and love the story. It gives us a real image to go with that. Raphael, we're coming up on our first break right now. So stay with me here and listeners stay with us and we will be right back. Think you've seen everything there is to see in online television? Let us surprise you. Visit voiceamerica.tv today for sports, health, business, and more on demand 24-7. Kathy Roberts is not only an exceptional radio host, she's an exceptional listener and counselor. Kathy appeals to motivated, high-functioning people to help them improve their health and vitality. Kathy can meet you where you are and help you identify what you want. Visit Kathy's website at www.kathyroberts.net or call her at 301-651-0019. Kathy works with both individuals and couples and specializes in grief and depression counseling. Get to know yourself by working with Kathy. Visit kathyroberts.net or call 301-651-0019. Kathy Roberts offers Circle of Voices teleclasses to help you focus your mind, engage your energy, and awaken your inner guide. Through this experiential and interactive series, you will know yourself more and learn to express yourself authentically in your personal life. Visit Kathy's website at kathyroberts.net to find out about this teleclass series designed to open you to change and engage healing in the fabric of your life. Go to kathyroberts.net or call Kathy at 301-651-0019 for more information. Follow us on Twitter at VoiceAmericaTRN. Get the lowdown on guests, new shows, and your favorites. That's VoiceAmericaTRN. You are listening to Voices for Healing with your host, Kathy Roberts. If you have a question or comment for the program, please send an email to kathy at kathyroberts.net. That's kathy at kathyroberts.net. Now back to Voices for Healing. In his book, The One Thing Holding You Back, Raphael writes, Our thoughts are not trustworthy when we are contracted. If we are contracted, Thoughts that seem rational and appropriate to a given situation are actually designed to avoid a feeling. This means our creative powers are limited and distorted whenever we are not willing to feel. This is Kathy Roberts on Voices for Healing, and my guest is Raphael Kushner. Raphael, can you pick up where we um, we left off as you were talking in the first segment about how often our ideas of what it's going to be like to feel are much bigger than the actual feeling, or much more scary than the actual feeling that we feel? And you told us a lovely story about that. And given that, how can we how can we move towards more feeling? How can we begin to learn to feel yeah. more? So the first thing I want to say in about that um, segment that you read, um, yes. the contraction is exactly what happens when that part of our brain I described in the in the first segment blocks our feeling. So that's what we mean by contracted. Um, it's natural. It's instinctive. It happens whenever we don't like or don't want something. And that's that state that's unreliable or untrusted that you were reading about. I just wanted to um, help with that clarification for listeners. Um, I appreciate that. Yes. Yeah. So, so one thing I wanted to say is that I didn't get to in the first segment is that there have been some studies that have been done that have shown that even the most intense feeling if we open to it fully, as we were talking about earlier, only lasts for, you know, a few minutes. Um, and this is pretty amazing to consider because many of us spend our whole lives organized around the, the, the desire to not feel a particular thing, which keeps us very stuck. And it, it never occurs to us that you know, we've spent those decades avoiding what might be three or four or five minutes only. Now, just to be clear, if you have a lot of grief or sadness or mourning, that doesn't mean that in three minutes it's over. But it, what it means is that every time you turn into that feeling, that that's about as long as it's going to last. And usually you don't have to do that so many times before you start to feel less intensely and, um, you know, over less time. So that brings us to the next part of your question to me, which was how do we do that? 
how do we start to make that happen? And the first thing that we need to know in order to do it is that all emotions are physical, that they, the only place you'll ever experience an emotion arise, move, shift, um, dissipate is in your physical body. So the way that we feel our emotions and not only go through it as quickly and easily as possible in the moment, but also simultaneously rewire our brain to correct that glitch is to pay attention to those physical sensations where they're happening in our bodies. And I call this surfing because in the, the model that I use for people, um, the attention, your attention is the surfer and the sensation in your body is the wave. And the important thing to recognize is that you can't surf a wave from the shore, which means you can't look from a distance and say, hmm, what am I feeling right now? And then let it kind of do its thing over there. You actually have to bring your attention right onto the wave, whether that's in your belly, your chest, your throat, anywhere that it's actually happening. So I know we'll talk more about this as we go along, but the gist of the answer to the question is that once you learn how to use your attention to surf your sensations in your physical body, that's the beginning of all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. So as we turn our attention from thinking, which is often where our anxiety gets generated as we think about all the possible things that might have happened in the past or happen in the future, and instead focus on the body, especially sometimes I like to think of it as focusing down the midline. Sometimes people will feel things in their arms or, or legs, but often I find it seems to be right down the midline of the body from the head to the belly. Um, and that's how we can begin to move into actually connecting with the emotion rather than thinking about it and ruminating or what, whatever we might be doing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And the, the key is that this active uh, process um, at first feels confusingly passive because people say, well, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. um, because in surfing a sensation, you're not trying to change it, understand it, or make it go away. You're actually letting it lead you to shore. And shore, in this case, is a state of renewed presence and openness, which is where we want to be in any moment, regardless of what's happening, whether it's emotional or otherwise. So um, it, it, it's a, a certain kind of a counterintuitive um, reorganization of our intention when we do this surfing. And the reason that I keep calling it surfing and, and stick with that even more than what in, in the book um, that you were reading from, I called the two by two process. And it's similar, just described a little bit differently. But the reason that I go with surfing now is that people recognize that when you're surfing in the ocean, you are not in any kind of effort to make the wave bigger or smaller or faster or slower. It would seem insane in the ocean because you're completely clear that your mission is to ride the wave as it is and let it take you. And that's the new practice that people have to get used to when they're surfing in their body. Mm -hmm. And and I love that as you describe it, I think, I think you have surfing, you talk about surfing in the book that I was referencing. If not, I read it on your website. And I love the way you talk about the surfer is an observer of what's happening, waiting for the wave to come and really knowing the right time to get on it and ride it and let it, let it take you where it needs to take you in um, that period of time. I want to highlight what you said, too, a, a few minutes back about um, – the emotions lasting for relatively short periods of time, like about three minutes when you're surfing and, and riding the wave of your emotion. And I think that's really stunning given that we do often do a whole lot to avoid what we're feeling. It's almost like um, one of the teachers in this area sometimes talks about emotions being like clouds in the sky. And you can watch the clouds go by and they're constantly changing. And our emotional state is like that too. Yeah, it's absolutely the case, and uh, it is really, really important to highlight. And 
I would say, interestingly enough, that that three minutes that we're talking about is on the long end. Um, most emotions, when I work with people individually and I guide them into this practice, um, come and go sometimes in as short as a few seconds. Um, or even if there's something that needs an expression or a catharsis, that too can just be, you know, 30 seconds or, or even just a minute. And the key is that these feelings need to be felt. And feeling is this surfing process that we're talking about. So that when they are felt, the message that they're bringing as this experience in your body um, no longer needs to remain within you because you've received the message. And when that happens, the feelings naturally dissipate. So the, the more practiced we get in this process, the faster it becomes because the message is sent and then the message is received. And that's how it's supposed to go. Mm-hmm. And you really talk about it and, and um, stress how it is a bodily process. It's not just something we're thinking in our minds. We're really connecting with the body. And I think that can be challenging for people sometimes. Sometimes I'll ask people what they're feeling, and they'll tell me a thought. <laughs> and right. right. And so for me, one of the things that I ask people often when they say they're feeling something is, how do you know you're having that feeling? Because mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't suggest that people believe what I'm saying about the physical nature of emotions. I really want them to have their own experience of it. So... Um, uh, every once in a while, there's someone that I work with who has a feedback mechanism that's a little hard to pin down, like they can't quite tell what they're feeling, but they just know it. But most of the time, if you ask someone what they're feeling, they tell you, um, or, or yeah, and, and, and then they can't locate it in your body. The next logical question is, well, what is the feedback mechanism you're referencing. How do you know you're feeling that way? And many of the times what happens is exactly what you described. On further investigation, it turns out that the person is calling something a feeling that is actually a thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people can pretty easily learn to tell the difference between thoughts and feelings when they do begin to pay attention to their bodies and what's happening in the body. Yeah, Yeah. that's absolutely right. Yeah. Is there a way that we can begin to retrain our brains so emotions feel less threatening? A lot of what we're talking about is allowing ourselves to feel more and recognizing that that can be um, a threatening thing to to do. Is there a way that we can um, begin to get more inner safety or comfort that we can do that? Yeah, well, the first thing to say is that when people don't feel safe, um, you know, none of this will make sense or will work. So I like to tell people that we can only go forward as fast and as fully as the slowest and most tentative parts of ourselves can go. And that whenever we push, there's always unfortunately going to be pushback. And so that's the path of willpower that I don't recommend. And I recommend the path of self-acceptance, meaning finally attuning to those parts of ourselves that are the most tentative and the most slow and going at their pace and always going into feeling only as long as it feels safe and coming out of it when it doesn't. Um, So safety is the number one most important principle. And this is especially true for people who have any kind of um, experience of trauma or abuse. Uh, I can't say enough about that safety being the most important thing in allowing the healing to happen. Um, Did you want to jump in there? Yeah, yeah, I did. I wanted to comment on how respectful that is because really um, I believe, and I think you do too, that each individual is really an expert about themselves and for them to know what what their limits are, what they are ready for in that moment is really important to pay attention to. I'm, I'm going to leave us with um, that thought as we get ready for our um, second break. Listeners, I hope you are enjoying this program with Raphael Kushner. This is Kathy Roberts on Voices for Healing. Stay right with us. We will be back with more emotional connection in just a few minutes.
Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Kathy Roberts offers Circle of Voices teleclasses to help you focus your mind, engage your energy, and awaken your inner guide. Through this experiential and interactive series, you will know yourself more and learn to express yourself authentically in your personal life. Visit Kathy's website at kathyroberts.net to find out about this teleclass series designed to open you to change and engage healing in the fabric of your life. Go to kathyroberts.net or call Kathy at 301-651-0019 for more information. Kathy Roberts is not only an exceptional radio host, she's an exceptional listener and counselor. Kathy appeals to motivated, high-functioning people to help them improve their health and vitality. Kathy can meet you where you are and help you identify what you want. Visit Kathy's website at www.kathyroberts.net or call her at 301-651-0019. Kathy works with both individuals and couples and specializes in grief and depression counseling. Get to know yourself by working with Kathy. Visit kathyroberts.net or call 301-651-0019. You are listening to Voices for Healing with your host, Kathy Roberts. If you have a question or comment for the program, please send an email to kathy at kathyroberts.net. That's kathy at kathyroberts.net. Now back to Voices for Healing. Raphael writes, when you're at a difficult crossroads, a vital question to ask is, am I about to choose from resistance or acceptance? Choosing from resistance means that you're going in one direction to avoid the emotional consequences of going in the other. This isn't bad or wrong, but it does mean, based on the nature of resistance, that you'll be visiting that temporarily avoided emotion further along the road. Choosing from acceptance means that you've felt into the worst-case scenarios for all possible directions, have expanded into an acceptance acceptance of the emotions they will likely elicit and are therefore reasonably confident that your decision-making process isn't motivated by emotional defense. As we're talking, we'd like to be able to share with the listeners Raphael's um, some of the methods that he uses and some of the practices that help people and techniques that help people develop emotional connection. Raphael, would you like to begin to take some of that on? Sure. The first thing I'd like to share um, that comes out of our previous discussion is that most of the time when people are surfing their emotions in their body, they will begin with the contraction, meaning that the ways that they usually tense up around situations in their lives that they don't like or don't want, whether it's you know traffic on the commute or impending rejection, Anything where they brace themselves against, they usually have one or two signature styles of doing that, whether it's a pressure at the temples or a tightening in the throat um, or the belly. Um, Those places are, well, they have the opportunity to become like a chime that, you know, basically rings and tells you, surfs up. And so the first technique is to Start by paying attention to where you're experiencing tension in your body in any particular moment. And the really important um, thing to know about this is that every contraction like that releases just by you paying attention to it. It's the nature of how our minds and bodies work together. And this is also about the rewiring that we've been talking about. Because our primitive brain, which is the one that blocks the feeling, is very powerful, but it doesn't run the whole show, and it knows that. So when you bring your attention to a contraction and decide to feel it, it's kind of like this. The primitive brain says, oh, what? Wait, what? We're doing something different? I I don't know if I like this. Uh, I'll... Uh, I reserve the right to shut it down at any moment, but uh, okay, let's go ahead, see what happens. And then we don't die, and the primitive brain can update. It says, oh, rejection, not footsteps in a dark alley. 
And then in the future, we don't have to shut down as intensely or as long because the primitive brain has learned about that particular felt experience. So the first technique is to recognize that our contraction itself, which has always up until now seemed like a problem, like something to solve or get rid of, is actually a beautiful announcement um, or invitation to begin the surfing process, both to be able to feel more fully in the moment and then also to update ourselves um, for the next time those feelings are going to come. I just love you saying that. It's so counter to so much of what we are have conditioned, what our conditioning is within ourselves to tense up when something happens. And it's you're reminding me of um, something I heard you talk about on another radio show four years ago, and you called it mental Aikido back then, having to do with Aikido, which is allowing and moving with the flow of what's happening rather than resistance. And what I wrote down that you said, I'm not sure how close this was, but when a unpleasant thought or feeling arises in us, if we say, oh, an unpleasant thought or emotion, well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Stay as long as you like and take up all the space you need. And when I heard you say that on the radio, I felt it in my body. This mm. piece that you're talking about, about how we can be contracted or more open and expanded. And I had heard that concept before, but something about the way you said it, I actually felt it. And it was so powerful that I wrote it down. I, I have it in front of me right now because I love it so much. That whole idea of in, inviting in something that we might in the past have wanted to push away from and yeah. how yeah. as we do that, over and over and over again, our, our, our tolerance for doing that increases and we can do more and feel more. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and thank you for bringing that up. And I really appreciate you remembering what I shared a long time ago. Um, I want to um, just uh, follow up on that with a couple other ways of describing what we're talking about. Um, one of them is a, is a book title um, that I came across many years ago, and I don't even remember the name of the person who wrote it right now, but it so struck me in the same way that, you know, what I had shared struck you. Um, the book is called, strangely enough, I've been in sorrow's kitchen and licked out all the pots. <laughs> and, and I mm. love that so much because what it, what, what it basically brought up for me was the idea that when you have turned toward your experience and really opened it, open to it, there's a kind of uh, a strength and a resilience that you can't get any other way, where you, you then are able to say, whatever life wants to bring, bring it on. Um, and then your happiness isn't dependent on your circumstances, what's happening around you or even inside you, because you realize you can be with anything. And the other thing I wanted to share is from a writer named Sherry Huber, who put it so beautifully, everything we're talking about right now. And one of the titles of her book is, When You're Falling, Dive. Mm. And, you, you know, going back mm. to that natural inclination to just tense yourself up while well, you're falling, right? And, you know, every bone in your body and every nerve and sinew wants to gird against the, the landing. Um, but, in fact, diving is going to re-enliven you and give you all of the, the courage and the information that you need to make the best choice possible. So, so we're using different words to point at the same thing, and that thing is that when you are with your experience as opposed to against it, uh, peace is yours always. It's right mm -hmm. there available for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, when you're with your experience rather than against it. That's, yes. that's yeah. beautiful in all the ways we're saying it. And I've, I've been given a lot of thought to happiness, too. You mentioned happiness 
not being not needing to be dependent on circumstances. And I don't know who said it, but within the last couple of months, I read something about um, happiness isn't the opposite of depression, but rather vitality is. And there's something in that that I like a lot, and it seems to be similar to what we're saying, in that maybe maybe feeling better or reaching some kind of endpoint or happiness isn't all there is to it. Maybe what it's really about is finding the vitality to meet whatever it that next thing is to dive when we notice that we're falling. To um, well, yes, I, I and I think it's really great that you're bringing that up in our conversation because the way I think of depression is exactly how it sounds. It's a depressing, it's a pushing down of our felt experience. And because that experience doesn't go away, as I described earlier, and it keeps getting stronger, it takes more and more of our life energy to keep it down. And so no wonder we're sapped and become listless and don't want to get out of bed. We think it's because we have no energy, but the truth is all of our energy is going to keep ourselves from having this experience. And when you take the lid off of that experience, you liberate the vitality that is naturally yours. And so if you're sad or if you're grieving or if you're jealous or you're lonely, these are all difficult emotions to experience, but you're not depressed when you're experiencing them. And people get confused between the idea of depression and having hard feelings when they're not at all the same. Because if you're actually with your difficult feelings, you're alive and mm-hmm. you're, you're here. And that's another way that you feel a certain satisfaction. And it's really hard for people to get that because many people experience of their most difficult emotions comes also with their resistance attached to it. So they don't know sadness without a simultaneous pushing away of sadness. And it's incredibly freeing to get a chance to have those experiences without any resistance. Mm. I, I just love what you're saying. And it really, once again, in my body, it rings true that... Mm that so much of the pain of our um, emotional experiences is the attitude or judgment that we attach to the fact that we're having them. Yes, and, and, and attitude and judgment for sure, and then in addition, just the friction of saying no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and one thing that can make this really um, uh, personal for listeners is to just ask themselves this question. What one or two emotions are the most difficult for them to feel? What are the things that either when they come up, they're really hard to feel, or they recognize that they actually go to great lengths to avoid feeling? Because once you understand this, you can see like a flashing neon arrow telling you where you've got a great opportunity for growth and healing. So for me, for example, um, humiliation is a feeling that I've recognized is really hard for me. I I, I will make a joke to cover up a mistake, and that's fine. But if if I have to be seen by you and everybody else making a terrible mistake that I can't fix, that's one of the hardest ones for me. And that means that now I can say, I'm actually, this is going to sound strange, but I'm actually looking forward to the next time that I experience humiliation so that I can become freer of my resistance, more present, more connected, more alive and with life. So, um, again, I just encourage everybody to just consider that question. What are the one or two or even three or four emotions that, um, you know, really that resistance to them dictates a lot of your choices and behaviors? This, this may seem like a challenge for some of you out there who are listening, but I really ask you to consider what Raphael's saying as each um, thing that arises before you that feels uncomfortable becomes something that it's okay 
it's okay to have that experience or that feeling or that thought and to be able to be with it and ride it and not take your energy and not put your energy into pushing it away or resisting. We're coming up on another break. So Raphael Kushner and Kathy Roberts, host, will be right back with you in a few moments. We will continue our conversation on the hidden power of emotions. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Kathy Roberts is not only an exceptional radio host, she's an exceptional listener and counselor. Kathy appeals to motivated, high-functioning people to help them improve their health and vitality. Kathy can meet you where you are and help you identify what you want. Visit Kathy's website at www.kathyroberts.net or call her at 301-651-0019. Kathy works with both individuals and couples and specializes in grief and depression counseling. Get to know yourself by working with Kathy. Visit kathyroberts.net or call 301-651-0019. Kathy Roberts offers Circle of Voices teleclasses to help you focus your mind, engage your energy, and awaken your inner guide. Through this experiential and interactive series, you will know yourself more and learn to express yourself authentically in your personal life. Visit Kathy's website at kathyroberts.net to find out about this teleclass series designed to open you to change and engage healing in the fabric of your life. Go to kathyroberts.net or call Kathy at 301-651-0019 for more information. Save on your prescriptions with the RX Savings Plus Drug Discount Card offered by Voice America. It is not insurance and discounts are only available from participating pharmacies, but 9 out of 10 pharmacies participate nationwide. Start saving today. Print your free card online at voiceamerica.rxsavingsplus.com or text the word TALK RADIO to 96362. You are listening to Voices for Healing with your host, Kathy Roberts. If you have a question or comment for the program, please send an email to kathy at kathyroberts.net. That's kathy at kathyroberts.net. Now back to Voices for Healing. I'd like to take a few moments now, Raphael. I hope you will um, like to let our listeners know some of your upcoming events before we continue with our discussion on the hidden power of emotions. Can you tell us where you'll be in the next couple of months as people might like to get in touch with you? Yes, absolutely. The first place that I will be is online, meaning that I'm going to be doing a six-week online learning experience called The Hidden Power of Emotions. Um, And there are four videos that help everybody learn what that's all about. And you can find those videos at the Hidden Power, no, just, no, the, excuse me, hiddenpoweroftheemotions.com slash video one. Those are free for you. Um, And when you want to learn more about that experience, you just go simply to hiddenpoweroftheemotions.com. And that's where you can um, get more information about the six weeks program and sign up. There are two places I'm going to be in person coming up soon. Um, The first one is at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. I'm going to be doing a weekend workshop there called The One Thing Holding You Back, Unleashing the Power of Emotional Connection. That's April 18th through the 20th. That's Easter weekend. And then there's a really special place that I'm going to be doing um, a longer four-day workshop, which is called Hollyhock. It's on an island off of the coast of Vancouver, Canada. Um, Because I'm doing it in the springtime this year, it's much more affordable. It's really easy to get to, and it's a place that if you go, you'll always remember for the rest of your life as one of the most precious experiences that you can have. So I will be there at Hollyhock um, May 14th to the 18th um, this spring, and you can find more about that at hollyhock.ca. And going back to Esalen, I forgot to mention the website for that. It's Esalen, E-S-A-L-E-N dot org. And you can just search my name and the workshop will show up. So those are the three highlights of what's upcoming. Oh, and I didn't mention that the... um, 
the online series, which will really get into what we've been talking about today in depth, um, will beginning will be beginning on April twenty eighth. Very good. Thank you for sharing all that you're doing. And um, listeners can find you at Kushner, C-U-S-H-N-I-R dot com and on Facebook. And I noticed on your Facebook page, Raphael Kushner, there is a a seven minute um, uh, MP3 that we can listen to. And you actually take us through the process of surfing your emotions that we're talking about on here. Yes, that's, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I should have done that years ago, and I just did it, um, meaning that if you want some guidance in getting used to this turning your attention to your body, there's um, like a four-and-a-half-minute um, uh, audio just with my voice, and then there's also one with music. And then recently, I don't think you know this yet, Kathy, some of my... Um, my community suggested that they wanted more time to be able to go through that experience more slowly and easily. So um, I just put one with and without music that lasts about 13 minutes. So whether you just want to get a taste or you want to dive in deeper, all of that is available to you on the same page that you can click either from the Facebook page or at kushner.com. That's my main website, C-U-S-H-N-I-R.com. And in this case, it's under the Resources tab, and it's um, a link that you can click that says Guided Surfing Meditation. I think that's what it says. Well, I'm among your um, fans who uh, is glad that you made a longer um, MP3. I listened to it. I loved it, and I felt the same thing. That Oh, I would like more. I would like to slow down and have more time with it. So I I really loved it, and I, I hope our listeners will check that out. So thank you for sharing what you're up to. I want to let our listeners know about a a three-class teleseminar I'm facilitating beginning Tuesday, April 1st. It's 7 Eastern, p.m. Eastern, and 4 Pacific, called Focus Your Mind, Engage Your Energy, Develop Your Inner Guide. This uh, three-class series will give you an introductory tools to develop the kind of mindfulness and vitality that support the practices that you're hearing about on our show today and that you've heard about on past shows and will hear on future. The size for this teleseminar is limited to 10 participants as there will be interaction among participants and with me. And the details are available on my website, which is kathyroberts.net on the classes page. Okay, Rafael, as we're coming up on the last, um, I don't know, six, seven minutes of our hour together here, I wonder if you can share some more with us some of the techniques or awarenesses that our listeners can begin to develop within themselves to help them be more in touch with and connected with their emotions and the healing that can happen when they do that. Sure. The first thing I want to um, add to everything we've been saying today is that when it comes to feeling these difficult and challenging feelings, I want all the listeners to know that you don't have to like the feelings and you don't have to want them and you don't have to agree that they can stick around forever. So this can be really freeing and can help your process because sometimes people think like, wait a minute, this is a fake. Like, I don't think I can do this or I don't think I want to do this if I'm supposed to just say yay for all of these, you know, really hard things. Mm -hmm. So feel free to not like and to not want them and you can still do this practice really well. The next thing. Yes, in fact, that can be part of your emotional experience of it to not push away those (laughs) feelings either. Right, like I'm really sad and I'm really angry that I'm sad. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Um, But the other thing that I want to say is that there's a simple practice that I use that's kind of the foundation for everything, and I call it living the question. And there are only two questions. And the first one is, what is happening right now? And the second question is, can I be with it? And the first question really means what's happening right now in my body. So as a meditation in daily life, not something you necessarily do on a cushion. You can do it when you're driving to work. You can do it when you're in your cubicle. You can do it when you're having a difficult conversation. You just ask, what is happening right now? And you let that question turn your attention to your body. And then you ask, can I be with it just as it is? And these two questions, if you practice asking them, even for just a couple of weeks, 
they become kind of automatic, so you don't even need the words anymore. The words just drop away. And this meditation in action is simply a turning of your attention to your body and then an embracing, or as we've been talking about, surfing of what you experience. So if you want to take everything from this uh, uh, call, this interview today, and wrap it up into one takeaway, and excuse me if, if you hear a terrible lawnmower sound in the background, I can't stop it, it's not mine. Um, yeah. But if you, if you want to take away one thing, it would just be to start practicing with those two questions, that whenever you remember, and sometimes purposely for a minute or two or three or four, just ask those two questions over and over again. What is happening right now, and can I be with it? That's beautiful. We're coming up on the end of our program, so we'll just say that one more time. What is happening right now, focusing on the body, and can I be with it? That's just really um, encapsulates what we've been talking about. So, um, Raphael, I want to thank you again for being a guest here on Voices for Healing Talk Radio. If you're able to hang on a moment at the end of the show, I would like to just chat with you for a moment. Is that possible? Absolutely. Great. And I want to thank you listeners. I'd love to hear from you about how this radio show is supporting your life. Next week, my guest is Hani Maletsky, Ph.D. Hani is a sex therapist and educator, and our topic will be sexuality and prostate cancer. Until next time, transform loss, embrace vitality. You've been listening to Voices for Healing with Kathy Roberts. Thank you for listening to Voices for Healing. Please join Kathy Roberts again next Monday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We wish you the best recovery from your loss, and we'll talk again next week. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. 